Father, we've come assembled in this place to worship you in spirit and to worship you in truth. Thank you for bringing us through another week and through dangers seen and unseen. Thank you for your mercy and thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace that picked us up every time we found ourselves falling to the left or falling to the right. But as we come now, we come to look to your word that we can find instruction, that we can find correction, that our faith can be strengthened, that our path can be brighter. Please feed my heart and my mind that I in turn will be able to feed these thy people. Forgive us, we ask, of all of our sins. Cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Open thou now my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. It's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Let each of us say amen. And certainly we thank the meal course for their uh, service and helping us to worship the Lord through song here this day. Just before we read the passage of scripture, I do want to remind you of Progressive that right after the benediction, right after the benediction, I want you to sit down just for a minute. As I told you last week, we got uh, some business to take, to take about maybe not more than five minutes uh, getting ready for the end of this month. So I just want to remind you of that. I want to read a couple of verses, verses 7 and 8 out of Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. Now, for those of you who are keeping notes and marking your Bibles and things like that, uh, you may run across that we were in, in or around this particular passage uh, not that far back um, some time ago. But there's another emphasis that we want to draw from this this morning, uh, not only as it relates to the story here, but also, again, uh, to evaluate ourselves. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> the scripture says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. I want to stop right there because most of us in here are familiar with the entire story that starts in verse 1 and comes on down. But I want you to think about this title this morning, Where is your sacrifice? Where is your sacrifice? Where is your sacrifice? I want it my way. It's the mindset of the world in which we live. Everywhere we look and we see it everywhere in schools, we hear it because young people want diplomas and they want degrees, but they don't want to study. I want it my way. We see it on the jobs because we want to come to work when we get ready. We want to do what we want to do when we get there. We want to dress how we want to dress going there. We want all the promotions, the privileges, and the positions. I want it my way. Yes, sir. In the family, husbands and wives, instead of finding common ground and moving toward, moving uh, forward together, they fight and even divorce because both of them want it their way. Children don't want to follow rules in the house. And not following rules in the house means that they don't learn to follow rules at school. Not learning to follow rules at school means they don't want to follow rules at church. And ignoring the rules every place else means that they are a misfit in society. But children need to understand that there's a reason for rules and regulations. The society has rules. You want to drive a car, the highway has rules. You want to play sports, there's even rules in order to play sports. When it comes to the church, uh oh Lord, we want it my way. Been in church all my life, been doing this for 50 years, I don't see any reason why I need a change. I want it my way. 
Don't care who the leader is. Don't care what's going on. Don't care what the pastor's asking for. Really don't care what God wants sometime, even though we don't say that, because we want it my way. Don't forget, the title is, Where is Your Sacrifice? The purpose of this message is for us to do a personal evaluation and commitment of our own relationship to God. It's to help us answer the question, how much we really love the Lord. Because it's easy to sit here on Sunday morning, it's easy to stand here behind this sacred desk and in these chairs and wherever we might be in a sanctuary. It's easy to sit in any church, anywhere, anytime, and we can open our mouths and talk about how we love the Lord. But the fact of the matter is, it's not what we say that determines how much we love him, it's what we do. It's how we serve, it's how we support, it's how we give. In the background of the scripture in Genesis 22, you know the story starting in verse 21. God had told Abraham after he had blessed him and Sarah with a son that he had told him that they were going to have in their old age. Here is Isaac now. I forget exactly how old Isaac was at this particular point. God tells Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, your only son, and I want you to take him out to the Mount of Mount Moriah in a place that I'm going to show you, and I want you to offer him to me there. Now I want you to understand something church the Bible lets us know that God was a friend of Abraham and Abraham was a friend of God we see that because Abraham's obedience to God was so pleasing before the Lord until the Lord imputed his faith his righteousness uh, as righteousness his obedience as righteousness before him so that God and Abraham are not enemies now before I go any further I want us to make understand a point here and that is just because we are saved and just because we have been born again, just because our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, just because we may be filled with the Holy Spirit, just because we may know God's word and be able to quote it from Genesis to Revelation, from Revelation back to Genesis, does not separate us, does not make us immune to some tests and some trials, tribulations, not only that come from this world, but some tests sometimes that will come from the Lord himself. Abraham and God were friends. But yet God tells Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take your only son, Isaac. I want you to take him out to the mount that I'm going to show you, and I want you to offer him up there. Then Abraham gets things together. He gets Isaac together. He gets a few men together. He gets the things together to make the journey, and then he sets out. But then as he sets down and reaches the place, uh, he recognizes that it's the place because however the Lord, Lord manifested to Abraham, Abraham knew that he was in the right place. And at this point now, he separates Isaac and himself from the rest of the men that were with them and take with them on up to the mountain. When they get to the mountain, they, they begin then to prepare an altar as God had already instructed Abraham to do. And as the altar is almost being complete, Isaac kind of gets a little bit of question in his mind. He looks around, he says, Father, he says, I see the fire and I see the wood. He says, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham speaks in a prophetic way, so to speak, because he said, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice sacrifice. Now I want you to know this, that, that, that God didn't tell Abraham anything about what he was going to do some thousand years down the road when Jesus would come on the scene. But know what Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Now I want you to look at that statement once again, because when Abraham says, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice, he's saying God is going to be the sacrifice himself. Are you listening to me, church? And so Isaac submits himself to that particular thing, and he binds Isaac's hands and lays him up on the altar and prepares to offer him for a sacrifice. And when Abraham draws back the knife to slay his only son, God speaks from heaven and says, Abraham, Abraham, do the lad no harm, because now I know that you will not, that, 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 uh, you will not withhold anything from me, even your son. In other words, what God was doing was calling on and testing the complete obedience of Abraham to him. Abraham Abraham was put to a test where he was about ready to sacrifice his son to demonstrate his total obedience to Almighty God. The question you and I have to answer this morning is how committed are we to God and what sacri where is our sacrifice when it comes to serving our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Because you see, we spend too much time in and outside the church making all kinds of excuses as to why we can't do this and why we can't do that and I don't like this person and I don't like that person 
and it's too hot and it's too cold and it's too it's too dark and 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 all these other sort of things but yet it amazes me that the same one brother deacons that's scared to go out to bible study in the dark on wednesday night you can find shopping in a mall that's got sidewalk sales at midnight i don't understand some people's philosophy i don't understand some people's idea but yet we say that we love the lord so the question is where is our sacrifice when it comes to really putting a definition on sacrifice the word can be described in this particular way is an act of giving up something that you want to keep now keep that in mind it's an act of giving up something that you want to keep in order to get or do something else or to help somebody keep that in mind it's an act of giving up something that you want to keep there's a very specific definition for the word sacrifice giving up something that you want to keep I'm going to cross this later in the message but it's easy for us to give up something we don't want I mean we do spring cleaning have rummage sales garage sales and stuff like it's easy for us to give up stuff that we don't want but the question is, is where is our so- by the way let me stop right here and let you all know why Jeff and Matt are sitting down here in front of this pulpit because you see they're about with their approval to be crowned as deacons in this church and so they're being initiated so they know what it's like to sit in front of this pulpit <laughs> <laughs> This pulpit's kind of hiding them, but I see them down there smiling. But, but, but where is our sacrifice? Where is our mind? Because it's easy to give up something that we don't want, that we don't have any more use for, that, that, that it's too small for us, it's too big for us, or, or, or it's about worn out anyway. It's easy to give that kind of stuff away. But what about giving something away that you really want? That's where the blessing comes from. It's also identified as an act of killing a person or an animal as an offering to please God. Well, one of the first point we need to understand is that when it comes to sacrifice, there's a command to sacrifice. And we see that primarily in the Old Testament, but it also has a New Testament reference as well that we're going to see here in a minute. There's a command to sacrifice. In Exodus and in Leviticus is where you see a whole lot of instruction that God God gives to Moses to give the Aaron concerning the children of Israel when it comes to all kinds of offerings and all type of offerings and how to offer these offerings and things. Oh, you see all of these things in Exodus and Leviticus in particular, starting out and going throughout the Old Testament. But Exodus chapter 20 verses 24 through 26 says, and an altar of earth shalt thou make unto me and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings and thy sheep and thine oxen and all places wherein uh, I record my name I will come unto thee and I will bless thee verse 25 and if thou wilt make me an altar of stone thou shalt not build it of hewn stone for if thou lift up thy tool upon it thou hast polluted it verse 26 neither shalt thou go up uh, go up by steps unto mine altar that thy nakedness not be discovered. That verse 26 is another sermon all in itself that is cover your nakedness before God. Amen. Peace. But, but then not only is there a command to, to the sacrifice, there's also qualifications of the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, as I've already told you, in Leviticus, the, the sacrifices had to be of the first year when it came to lambs, when it came to bullock. They had to be of the first year. They had to be without blemish and all these other things, turtle doves and things like that had to be split certain ways. So the Old Testament had rules and qualifications in order for the sacrifice, the offering that was being made to be acceptable before God. God. And all of this does, church, is set down a standard for us that's brought over into the New Testament in a different way to help, again, help us recognize that we just can't offer anything before the Lord, any kind of way we want to offer it, and expect him to be pleased with it. It just does not work that way. We've got to get self out of the way. We've got to get I out of the way. We've got to get my way out of the way and say, yes, Lord, thy will be done. So when in the Old Testament is an example of that in Leviticus, where there's all kind of instructions on all the different types of offerings that is to be made. But when it comes to the New Testament, we see in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, the Lord makes a statement right here that calls for a personal sacrifice 
if we're going to be a disciple of his. He says in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 16, then said Jesus unto his disciple, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You can't have it your way and do it my way too. We got to make up our mind which side we want to be on. He's calling for a personal sacrifice. We've got to give up what we want and then follow after him so that we can do his will. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20, the apostle Paul writes this. In other words, I'm going to ask the question, why do we need to deny ourselves? Because Paul gives us the answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 when he says, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If we've been born again, Paul is saying, not only does your spirit belong to God, which is what we want to talk about, he lets us know our body also belongs to God because he says, which are God's, which have been bought with a price. In other words, it's, it's natural to think that when you have paid for something, it belongs to you. When's the last time you went to the store and bought a suit or bought a dress or bought some shoes or bought some groceries and as soon as you handed the clerk your money, somebody comes along and takes all those items and puts them back on the shelf so that somebody else can come along and use it. I mean, some of us, even though we say we're Christian, would hang our religion up on a nail and give somebody a piece of our mind. I ain't picking on nobody. I'm just saying what I'm saying. In other words, if you have paid the price, it belongs to you. Do you understand that? So Paul is saying, don't you know that you have been bought with a price? You are not your own. Your body belongs to the Lord. Your spirit belongs to the Lord, which are his. So why do we get upset when he tries to use us? He has paid for us. We belong to him and not ourselves. In Luke chapter 6, verse 32 through 34, Jesus gives us some examples, really, of how the Christian is supposed to be going the extra mile with some things. In other words, we are called to a life of making sacrifices. We don't have the privilege of believers of acting on how we feel and what we want to do all the time. Because sometimes, some folk can get you so upset until you want to go to Knuckle City with them. Uh-huh. Yeah. And we can't do that. We, we've got to go the extra mile. We can't act like the world. We can't do everything else. Look at what Luke says, in, uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 32 through 34. He says, for if you love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. Verse 33, and if you do good to them that do good unto to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. Verse 34, and if ye lend to them uh, to whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners who receive as much again. In other words, in other words we are responsible for moving beyond the norm. And in order to move beyond the norm, it calls for a sacrifice. It calls for denying ourselves. It calls for us having a mindset like Abraham that says, Lord, in spite of the fact that you've asked me to do something very precious, in spite of the fact that you asked me to give up something that's very dear to me in spite of the fact that you gave me this blessing I realize that you're able to take care of things and I'm willing to give it back to you even though I'm wrenched in my spirit and I don't understand what's going on where is your sacrifice because I'm going to tell you something and I'm not thinking of nobody I'm just saying what I'm saying there isn't a reason in the world and I don't care how big the congregation is there isn't a reason in this world for any church anywhere that names the name of Christ not to be able to do what God wants it to do if the people that make it up would make the sacrifice they're supposed to and do it starting with giving tithes and offerings because the tithe belongs belongs to the Lord. That tenth belongs to him. It is mine. But yet some of us don't even want to give the Lord what belongs to him. So you want to talk about me asking him or giving him a sacrifice? I ain't picking on nobody. I'm just saying what I'm saying. An offering, can, an offering of sacrifice cannot come forward until we've been obedient to what God has commanded. That tenth belongs to him. 
The devil puts it into our mind, well, you're on a fixed income. Well, yes, we are on a fixed income. But if we know Jesus, I heard Paul say, for my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. When we are obedient to him, he's able to make the crooked way straight. He's able to open the door that nobody wants to open. He's able to turn the, dark, the light on in the midst of the dark. I'm not talking about what somebody told you, told me. I'm telling you for myself that he is able to fix things even before they happen when we are obedient to what he's told us to do. But we don't want to make the sacrifice. Yes, uh -huh. Calls for a willing heart and a willing mind. And Jesus shows us this in John chapter 6 verse 38. He says, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So that if we're going to have the right mind and the right heart, we have to make up our mind then that we have to be totally surrendered and learn to be totally surrendered, learn to be obedient to Almighty God. There has to be a willingness. And I can't stress that enough. It needs to be a willingness. It really does not count before the Lord for anything that whatever we do, we do it grudgingly. <laughs> The scripture says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Is that right? A cheerful giver. So that means that when it comes time for offering, if you got to come down the aisle with your lip dragging a carpet and slobbers running everywhere because you don't want to give, you might as well turn around and go down and sit right back down in that pew and put it right back in your pocket because there's no, there's no blessing coming when we're giving grudgingly. Whatever our service is, whatever our positions and titles are, if we aren't committed to what we're doing, and if we can't serve without a grudging spirit, it absolutely accounts for nothing. We're not doing anything but taking up space and getting in somebody else's way if we're going to do it grudgingly. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, and I'll just read verses 5 through 8. He says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and, made, um, and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What if Jesus had argued with the Father? I don't want to go down there. I don't want to go through all that suffering and agony. And pain. I don't want to go through all of that rejection. I like it right here. Suppose he had had that attitude. But look, he gave it up. Came down through 40 and two generations. He gave it up. And the reason why he knew he could give it up is because he knew he was going to take it up again. And you and I have that same promise. Whatever it is that we're giving up for the Lord right now, we have a promise he's going to bless and reward us again. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And therefore, my beloved brother, be you steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If the Bible says if you get a preacher, a prophet, a drink of water in the name of the Lord, even God has a blessing for that. But we don't want the sacrifice. Where there's a call to sacrifice. And that call is to be committed. Paul identifies it for us in Romans chapter 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Yeah. Now, I don't know if I can make this make sense, but with the Lord's help, maybe, uh, maybe it will. Because many times, it seems like we can find people to want to get on board with a martyrdom mind. And when I say a martyr to mine, I mean somebody who says, oh yeah, I'm willing to, I'm willing to die for the Lord. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, willing, I'm willing to stand on Jesus' name. If they want to shoot me down because of that, I'm willing to die for the Lord. Well, that's noble. And that's good. It's good you got that kind of strong conviction. But let me tell you something else the Lord is looking for. He's looking for some living sacrifices. 
Are you listening to me? He's looking for some living sacrifices. Don't we sing it? Don't we sing uh, all to Jesus, I surrender? Don't we say all to him, I freely, 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 give. God's grace is so amazing. Because don't you know that every time we sing that song, that disturbs divine justice enough that if God let it, it will wipe us out. All to him I freely give. All to Jesus I surrender. Well, stop holding on so tight. And I ain't just talking about money. I'm talking about our whole attitude. I'm talking about our whole servant. Stop holding on so tight. Stop being so afraid to love each other. Stop being so afraid to encourage each other. Stop being so afraid because it looked like somebody got blessed more than you. Stop being so afraid. Stop holding on. Let it go. Praise God. But then there's a twist to sacrifice. And I've already given you this twist of sacrifice in the definition. The twist of sacrifice versus a general offering because the twist is if it doesn't cost you something, it won't carry a blessing. If it doesn't cost In other words, whatever we're offering, whatever we're doing, particularly to the Lord, if it doesn't cost us something, then it won't carry a blessing. In other words, we're just just going through the motions. You want to see an example of what I'm talking about? Luke chapter 21, verse 4. And and I'll just read verse 4, but you can read verse 1 and come on down, and you'll see the setting in which this is set in. Luke chapter 21, verse 4, Jesus says this, For all these have of their abundance cast into the um, offerings of God, but she of her uh, punary has cast in all the living that she has. This is the story that we call the widow's might. Jesus and the disciples are sitting over against the corner of the temple treasury and they're sitting watching all these rich people come by and toss their offerings into the temple treasury. And, 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 and he says, these are tossing in their, 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 their offering. They're tossing it in out of their abundance. In other words, they're giving what they're giving because they've got plenty. They won't miss it. But here comes this widow woman. And at least the background or context of it is, is even the two mites, these two uh, uh, thing pits or whatever they call them that she has, the, the background is that she was so poor until she even had to sweep or, or skirt around her house even to find these two little things to bring to the temple to offer something to the Lord. Now here is the Lord of glory. Here's the Lord who created heaven and earth. Here's, the, here's God who has taken on flesh, was born in Bethlehem of Judea, sitting over the temp, sitting over against the temple wall and watches this poor widow woman and she brings these two little mites, these two little pieces of money and brings them to the temple treasure and his divine eyes see what she's doing. She's making a total sacrifice and look what he tells the disciples. This woman has cast in more than all of these who have given out of their abundance. If if it doesn't cost you something, there's no blessing to go with it. You notice that he did not say a thing about those who cast, who are rich. He did not pronounce any blessing about them, but he, he makes a divine a recognition upon this woman's offering. She is, he, she is, she is given more than all of the rest of them put together. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. If it don't cost you something, then it won't carry a blessing. Many of you in here remember Deacon Jordan Davis years ago. And Deacon Davis and I went to do visitations uh, for sick and shut in. And I was trying to help Pastor Hudson out and some things. So often Deacon Davis and I would get together and go visit and share. And, and without fail, 
without fail, almost every time he and I went out, he would not let me leave him, Sister Ford, until he gave me something. <laughs> it was usually a tie, some sort of tie that he would take from his collections of ties and gives me, he said, because pastor, he said, we didn't call me pastor, he said, well, Reverend, I want to give you something. And one day, I, he gave, he, he did so, he did it so many times until I started feeling guilty. I started thinking, well, you know, he ain't gonna have no ties left pretty soon. And that sort of thing. And I said, no, Brother Davis. I said, don't you want this? That's what I said. Don't you want, because it was a nice tie. I said, don't you want this tie? You know what he said to me? He says, yes, I want it, but it wouldn't mean anything if I didn't. All right, all right. If it don't cost you something that you're giving away, there's no blessing that come behind it. <laughs> sacrifice. So the question is, is where is your sacrifice? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> this was Abraham's only son, and you can't get any more of a sacrifice than being called upon to offer your own son. You can't get any more than that. But I want to let you know that Jesus said in John 10, he says, no man, I believe I had this verse right, no man takes my life, he said, but I, I offer it. In other words, I lay it down. I'm offering it. You remember when Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, he says, he says, I've caught all things but lost, all things but dung, that I might gain the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul said, whatever I've had, whatever my education is, whatever my title was, whatever I've gained, I've caught it all but lost, no good behind me, that I might gain a better understanding and knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> The writer of Hebrews puts it to us this way. In Hebrews 12, 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, <clears throat> despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In the Old Testament, man was to offer a sacrifice to God. <clears throat> In the New Testament, it's God who offers himself a sacrifice for man. I've already told you, you can't get any deeper. You can't go any further than when you offer your own son. And aren't you glad that the Father loved us enough? Aren't you glad that he was willing to make that sacrifice cause heaven to be devoid of the second person of the Trinity that had been a part of the Trinity forever? And this was the only time a separation had taken place, yet he came down through 42 generations because the Father was about to offer his own son as a sacrifice for us. And to Calvary he went with his hands stretched out and his head bowed between his shoulders hanging there from the sixth to the ninth hour and he gave up the ghost and he died and they buried him on Friday but early Sunday morning he took up his, he stepped out of the grave with all power in his hand and took up his power and declared that all power in heaven and earth is in my hand it doesn't get any more sacrificial than that and do you know what it's personal. I've used this before, and I see, can't seem to get away from this word. It's personal. In other words, your name was in his hands. Your name was on his heart. Your name was on his mind. While he was hanging there, suffering and hurting, your name and your name and your name and my own name was in his mind on his heart, in his hands. It's personal. A personal sacrifice. And the question is, is where is your sacrifice? Yes, when it comes to serving him, where is your sacrifice? When it comes to giving, where is your sacrifice? When it comes to loving, where is your sacrifice? When it comes to forgiving each other, where is your sacrifice? When it comes to doing good, where is your sacrifice? When it comes to working to your time, where is your sacrifice? When it's too hot, where is your sacrifice when it's too cold where is your sacrifice when you're getting older where is your sacrifice when sickness wrecks your body where is your sacrifice I want to hear him say well done where is your sacrifice yes, sir. 
there's another song that we sing sometime. Is your all on the altar? I ain't talking about Sally's. I ain't talking about Joe's. I'm talking about yours. Is your all on the altar? I got news for us, Progressive. It ain't nothing in this world worth sacrificing Jesus for. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you understand what I'm saying? We get crazy. People getting upset. The economy's all messed up. A country coming apart over who's going to be the next president. I'm going to tell you the truth. We in a mess. I don't, I don't care who's president. We still in a mess. And we in a mess because of who's president. We're in a mess because this entire nation has turned its back on God. That's why we're in a mess. Don't worry about who's in the White House. You remember who's sitting on the throne. Is your all on the altar? I'm going to my seat. But is your offering like Cain's? You offer God what you want. And even that what you offer is not your best. Is your offer like Ananias and Sapphira that you see in Acts chapter 5? It was a free will situation. They didn't have to give. But like so many other people, they wanted to be a part of the crowd because everybody else is doing it. We don't want to stick out. We want to do it too. But their heart was not committed. When they sold their property, instead of bringing all those funds that they promised to God back to the apostles, they kept part of it and lied and said, this is all of it. And the Bible lets us know, I don't have time to go through the whole story, the Bible lets us know that Ananias fell dead right at Peter's feet. Peter said, you have not lied unto man, you have lied unto God. You didn't have to do this, but since you promised it, you should have did it! Sapphira got to thinking about all them hats she could buy. All them shoes. Why do sisters like shoes so much? All these other things. And she went and told the same lie. And the same men that carried her husband away were on their way back to carry her away because she fell dead too. Is your sacrifice like Cain's and Ananias and Sapphira? Or is it like Abraham to say, yes, Lord? Yes. Is it like Paul to say, I count all but loss to know Jesus? Or is it even a, can we even put it in the category of Jesus that no, no man has greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friends? Where is your sacrifice? Progressive? When it comes time for you and I to say goodbye to this whole world, we're not going to be able to say, well, Lord, I didn't do because the deacons didn't do. We had some tricky trustees. We had some mixed up mission departments. We had some quarreling choir members. All this, and that's the reason why I didn't give is because that preacher up there was no good and I knew he wasn't going to spend the money right. The Lord ain't going to hear that. Because you see, what belongs to him is his. It ain't your business what God does with his. <clears throat> Where is your sacrifice? The doors of the church are open. There might be one here that does not know the Lord and the pardon of their sin. He said, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. <clears throat> Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He said, if any man will open up, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Paul says, if you're willing to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If there's one here this morning, we invite you to come. If you've never 
acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you've never called upon his name, saying, Father in heaven, save me by the blood of Jesus because I know I can't save myself. I believe that when he was crucified, he was crucified to pay my sin debt. He, I accept him as my personal sacrifice and thank you, Father, for loving me so much. I accept him by faith for what he did on Calvary. If you've never told the Lord that in so many words and let him know that you want to be saved, this invitation is for you. This is your day to come. This appeal is being made to you because the Lord is calling you right now. What you need to know is there's a heaven to be gained, but there's a hell to be shunned. Don't fool yourself. Everybody in here is going to wind up in one or two places. Heaven in, in G, with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all the angels and all the other saved saints that's gone on before us or we'll spend an eternity in hell. Everybody in here is going to live forever. The question is, is what side you're going to spend it on? And so if you're here this morning and you don't know him, this is your opportunity. You sacrifice your own mind. You sacrifice your own way. You forget about trying to please the world. You forget about what somebody else is trying to make you be and you focus your mind on what God wants you to be. If you're here this morning, we invite you to come. Candidate for Baptism, Christian Experience, we invite you to come.